All right. So since I, I enjoy a good challenge, I thought I'd talk about the 11th Corps at Gettysburg uh, today. Uh, I wrote a two-volume history of the 11th Corps. Uh, coincidentally, I happened to bring some with me. Uh, I think they're published at, what, thirty-four ninety-five, but you can have them since you're my close personal friends for $20 a piece. So if you're interested, come on up and see me afterwards, okay? In fact, I think Jonathan, didn't you tell me the doors were locked and they can't? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Chicago way. They're exactly, the Chicago way. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's get going. Uh, Oliver Otis Howard is the commander of the 11th Corps at uh, Gettysburg. He's a West, trained at West Point. Uh, I like to call him the Teflon General <laughs> because his, his brigade was routed at first bull run and he was promoted. Uh, he lost an arm in the peninsula, didn't do very well. He was promoted again. Uh, ends up in charge of the 11th Corps. Uh, from my perspective, at least, he's largely responsible for the disaster at Chancellorsville. And by the end of the war, he ends up leading an entire army. Uh, so I just I goes to show you a slip or, or two or three or five, maybe you can still succeed. Uh, Francis Barlow. Uh, an attorney, Harvard Law School, uh, worked for a while at the New York Tribune, so he had no real serious military training, uh, but he was uh, very brave on the peninsula. Uh, he was wounded at Antietam, had a reputation for being aggressive, but also a very strict disciplinarian. The second division was led by Adolf von Steinwehr. Uh, von Steinwehr graduated from Brunswick Military Academy. He came to the United States as an observer during the U.S.-Mexican War, uh, fell in love with an Alabama damsel. And they settled down in New York and in the German community there. So he was elected colonel of the 29th New York when the war began. And he was generally considered to be a calm, efficient officer. And the third division was led by Carl Schurz. Uh, Schurz was born in Cologne, participated in the 1848 revolutions in Germany, in uh, Eastern Europe and Germany. Um, Schurz is kind of interesting because he became, along with Franz Siegel, somewhat of a hero among German Americans. At the end of the revolutions in 1848, when they were arresting people who participated and thrown that, throwing them in what later became Spandau prison, uh, people were trying to figure out how to escape. Carol Schurz was not rounded up, but he was trying to figure out how to break into the prison. <laughs> so he eventually broke into Spandau Prison, rescued his commanding officer, and the two of them broke out. So he became a hero among German Americans once he got here. Uh, he was a very fervent anti-slavery orator, campaigned for Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln made him minister to Spain as a reward for his support. But when the war broke out, he came back and said he really wanted to be where the fighting was. So Lincoln made him a brigadier general. So we have of the three division commanders and the corps commander, two were West Point trained, uh, well, not West Point, two were military academy uh, trained, one in Germany, one at West Point. The other two had no real serious military background and earned promotion largely for political reasons. Look at the Army of the Potomac going into the Gettysburg campaign. The 11th Corps is the second smallest. Uh, and one of the disadvantages it had was that each of its divisions only had two brigades instead of the normal three. So you lose some of the tactical efficiency uh, and flexibility that you normally would on a battlefield. But there's another interesting thing here too. The three smallest corps, what do they all have in common? Smallest number of artillery. Yeah, okay. The three that first get into the L. The, the, well, yeah, all right. I'm learning something tonight, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking there were the three that were in Pope's, John Pope's Army of Virginia. And when they were transferred or amalgamated into the Army of the Potomac, the first corps was okay because they started out in the Army of the Potomac before they were sent to Pope. But the other two had never served in the Army of the Potomac. All three of them were kind of looked at as scans. And you'll notice none of them 
were really brought up to normal strength, even though reinforcements were coming in and being apportioned to the other corps. So the campaign begins. June 3rd, Lee starts moving west, and then he moves north uh, into the Shenandoah Valley. Hooker gets the bright idea once he figures out Lee is gone. Hey, if Lee's not here, I can take Richmond. <laughs> so picture yourself as a politician. Not hard in Chicago. You hear a lot about that. <laughs> You're sitting in Washington, and the general says, you know, while Lee is romping north, who knows where, I think I'm going to go take Richmond. What are you going to say? I don't think so. Come back and protect me. So Hooker's ordered to march north and confront Lee. June 13th, Pleasanton's Union Cavalry surprises Jeb Stewart at Brandy Station. On the same day, Lee's advance reaches Winchester. And Hooker decides, following orders, now to start moving north. You can see the enormous distance advantage that Lee has on Hooker at this point. <clears throat> Hooker reaches uh, Centerville on the 16th, the same day Lee reaches Harper's Ferry. There's cavalry fighting going on in between the two armies as uh, Stewart's cavalry tries to shield the movement north and Pleasanton's cavalry supposedly is trying to find their whereabouts, although he seems more interested in engaging in cavalry fights. June 27th, you've got um, Longstreet and Hill just slightly above the Pennsylvania line. Uh, Ewell is spread out between York and just south of Harrisburg. The 11th Corps crosses uh, Edwards Ferry on the Potomac River. Uh, so you can see they're still pretty far behind the Confederates. As they move north, they reach Middletown around June 28th. On the 29th, they're north of Frederick. And on June 30th, they encamp just north of Emmitsburg, just south of the Pennsylvania line, while the First Corps encamps just north of the Pennsylvania line, just a few miles Separating. So on the eve of the battle, the 1st and the 11th Corps are the two closest uh, corps to uh, Gettysburg. Interestingly, Meade, who has now replaced Hooker, ordered them to consolidate along Pipe Creek, which is a lot farther to the east. So when the battle begins on July 1st, Harry Heath's division moves toward Gettysburg. They run into Buford's cavalry. Keith takes about an hour, hour and a quarter to deploy. And then he begins gradually pushing Buford back in the, uh, toward the vicinity of Seminary Ridge. And this is where the first corps starts to arrive. Wadsworth Division, which you're probably all familiar with, and had some uh, Indiana, Michigan, and three Wisconsin regiments in the Iron Brigade. Now uh, they show up and uh, deploy. We kind of turn it so I can get everything on the screen here. Uh, Archer's Alabama Brigade advances. Uh, they're roughly handled by the Iron Brigade. Archer's captured and they go back to reform. Doubleday's division shows up and they deploy. Joe Davis's uh, Brigade of Mississippi and North Carolina troops Joseph Davis being the nephew of one Jefferson Davis, gets the bright idea he's going to try to outflank the Union position. So he moves his brigade somewhat like this. Uh, Wadsworth refuses the flank, and this is the famous incident where uh, much of Davis's brigade is caught in the railroad, cut and cut off, and eventually uh, a large portion of his brigade has to surrender. So now we look something like this. Enter Pender's division, and they deploy. And then the last of the first corps arrive. Robinson's division <coughs> prolongs the Union line to face the new Confederate troops. They advance and start pushing Robinson back toward Seminary Ridge. And then Robert Rhodes arrives. Not a very pleasant position for the First Corps. 
And it's right about this time that the 11th Corps starts to arrive now. Howard arrives only to find out that Reynolds is now dead. So he's in charge of the whole field. So he becomes kind of the general in chief momentarily. The ranking major general in the Corps is Carl Schurz. So he assumes command of the Corps. And that, you know, if you have dominoes that go all the way down the line, which I'll get to in a minute or two. So the 11th Corps starts to show up. And uh, Howard orders two divisions north of town to support the 1st Corps. And he keeps Steinwehr's division back on Cemetery Hill as kind of a reserve on the one hand, but also to make sure that there's a rallying point in case they have to get pushed back. Because remember, they're still under orders from Meade to fall back to the Plum Run line, but the fighting has already started and they can't very well disengage at this point. So if we look at the northern part of the line, first to arrive is uh, Hubert Dilger's battery, uh, I, First Ohio. The little red dots are skirmishers, and they go into line and open fire. Next, you have two small regiments totaling not more than 500 people total between the two of them. They're sent out as skirmishers to protect the battery. 45th New York shows up next. They send out skirmishers and push the Confederates back, taking the McLean house or barn. Uh, Wheeler's 13th New York battery shows up. And then the 82nd Illinois and 157th New York uh, uh, form behind them as supports for the two batteries. Alexander Schimmelfenning takes over Schertz's division. This is the first time he's ever led a division in combat. George von Amsburg takes over Schimmelfenning's brigade. This is the first time he ever leads a brigade in combat. I mention this because I've read in a couple places talking about the first corps. I said, well, some officer, I forget who it was, uh, you know, had to take over a division command and they never commanded a division before. Well, there were a lot of instances of that in the 11th Corps. That was not particularly unique. So at this point, O'Neill decides to send his Alabama brigade to try and flank the first corps, which puts them in a perfect position to be enfiladed by the 45th New York. And then Dilger starts to fire shell over them into the Alabamans. And they're pretty much decimated and retreat hastily. Then the two 11th Corps batteries open fire on Page's Confederate battery on Oak Hill. They do considerable destruction and it's withdrawn. Now, don't believe me. Believe people that were there. Uh, Colonel Hall uh, wrote about his command that was under a front and enfilading fire with no support and suffered, suffered a very severe loss. Actually, his regiment lost 66% of its troops. Uh, Colonel O'Neill said, we were compelled to fall back as the regiment on the extreme left, the one next to the 45th New York, was being flanked by a superior force. The superior force was six companies of one regiment and gave way. And the Confederate artillery chief talks about how Dilger's battery uh, roughed up uh, Page's battery and it had to be withdrawn. So, so far the 11th Corps is doing pretty well, I think. Schertz, as I mentioned, is now commanding the 11th Corps. He's now faced with what do I do to form some sort of line out on this plane where there really aren't any natural obstructions. You've got what's commonly referred to as the almshouse, which really isn't a house, it's a complex of buildings. So Schertz starts to deploy Schimmelfenig's division in this manner uh, with the two batteries. And then as Barlow's division arrives on the field, he plans to deploy them off to the right toward Rock Creek, Van Gilsa and Ames. So he's forming kind of a straight line across the plateau anchored on Rock Creek with, with uh, Union, Artil Union uh, Cavalry beyond Rock Creek to guard the flank and the batteries in the middle offering support in case there's an infantry attack. This falls apart 
when Francis Barlow decides that he knows better and decides to advance his entire division without even bothering to tell the corps commander. <laughs> By doing this, he moves his two brigades out to Blocker's Knoll. This is a problem because both of his flanks now are completely in the air, no support at all. And there are several thousand yards from the nearest federal troops. Think Dan Sickles. Now, this is what Sickles does the next day on a much bigger scale. And this is what Barlow achieves. It's okay as long as the Confederate line ends here because you know, Doles isn't going to really offer too much of a problem since uh, Barlow is outflanking him. But then Richard Ewell's corps starts to arrive from the north. And you have Gordon, and you have Hayes, and you have Avery, and you also have Smith's Virginians, which I couldn't fit on the screen. <laughs> Does anyone think this is going to turn out well? <laughs> Confederates, 6,300 Confederates aligned against 2,237 Federals. So they're outnumbered, the Federals are outnumbered by about three to one. Even if you eliminate Avery and Smith, now Avery and Smith became engaged that day, but not in the first attack. So even if you eliminate them uh, from the blocker Knoll numbers, it's still a two to one Confederate advantage. So we're looking something like this. The other problem they have by moving to Blocker's Knoll is that they're now in range of Confederate artillery on Oak Hill. And as Ewell comes up, his artillery catches Barlow's division in a crossfire. Anyone want to volunteer to be in, the, in Barlow's uh, division facing all of this? So Ames moves up a couple of regiments to try and guard uh, Von Gilsa's flank. Doles moves forward, so does Gordon, outflanking the initial line. And then Hayes and Avery also move forward. So what chance do they have? Now, if you've got 2,000 men and you stand one person every mile, you can cover 2,000 miles. But if the other person has 4,000 men, they're going to be able to outflank you at some point. Now, there simply aren't enough men, no matter how far you stretch them, to avoid at some point being flanked. Barlow's seriously wounded. Ames assumes command of the division, the first time he's led a division in battle. Andrew Harris assumes command of the brigade, the first time he's ever led a brigade in, in combat. Uh, Harris later goes on after the war to be elected governor of Ohio. So Barlow's troops start to retreat. Schertz orders in his reserve under Colonel Krzyzanowski, but by this time it's way too late. The 4,300 Confederates now attacking, and the reserve call up is 1,400. And you can guess what happened. And they, of course, get outflanked again. They retreat back to the vicinity of the almshouse where they rally um, all these different commands. And once again, of course, they're outflanked because they simply don't have enough men to man the line. They retreat back toward Gettysburg. Is it a retreat or a rout? I've spent more time already than most books do even covering this. Usually it's one or two sentences. Oh, and the 11th Corps was routed and fell back, and that was the end, and that's why the Union lost the first day. Well, I'm not sure. If you were a Confederate, what did you think? Uh, G.W. Nichols, 61st Georgia. The Yankees stopped and made a desperate stand. Their officers were cheering their men and behaving like heroes and commanders of the first water. Ewell, who led the Confederate Corps, called it in his report an obstinate contest. Jubal Early, whose division led the assault, called it a hot contest. 
John Gordon, whose brigade led the assault, in a letter to his wife written about five or six days after the battle, called it an obstinate resistance and a desperate fight. 21st Georgia, hard fight. Our loss was very heavy. I think they fight harder in their own country than they do in Virginia. 57th North Carolina, I can inform, inform you that the Army met there. It was the hardest fight I was ever in. Uh, an officer on the staff of the Louisiana Brigade wrote it was a heavy fire. The musketry was very severe, and we feared Gordon would be borne back. Uh, 26 Georgia, stubborn fight. 6th Louisiana, stubborn resistance. Uh, Ninth Louisiana, the fighting was fast and furious. Apparently, unlike later authors, <laughs> the Confederates thought they actually had a fight on their hands. <laughs> so now Howard's at uh, Delamba. The right flank of the 11th Corps is being driven back. But at the same time, Doubleday, who replaced Reynolds in the 1st Corps, is sending messengers back saying, my flank is about ready to be turned. I need reinforcements. What do I do? He, of course, only has two little tiny brigades up on Cemetery Hill. So he decides the biggest problem right now is the right flank. So he sends Charles Coster's brigade out. Coster, of course, never having commanded a brigade in combat before. They go through Gettysburg, and they end up at John Hewn's brickyard. He deploys. Heckman's Ohio Battery comes up to lend some support, uh, also sent by Howard from the reserve. And they're facing initially the Hayes, Louisiana, and Avery's North Carolinians. They actually drive back the Louisianans in their first attack, but then the two brigades attack in tandem, and of course, Avery outflanks the line, and they're forced to again fall back. So we're looking something like this. Uh, Pender's division starts to drive in Doubleday's left. Uh, Ramser's brigade starts to drive in Robinson's right. And about this time, Howard sends an order to both Schertz and Doubleday to retreat back to Cemetery Hill. Doubleday goes across the open fields, gets there no problem. Wadsworth, for the most part, goes through open fields and the uh, suburbs, gets there with no problem. Robinson has to go through part of the town. And of course, this leaves Von Amensburg out there all by his lonesome. So he has to retreat too. He has to retreat through town and bingo, they both end up at the same intersection at roughly the same time. So we were talking before uh, the presentation. Uh, sometimes you get letters from somebody saying, oh, you know, we had an easy time or somebody else says, oh, it's a struggle. Well. One of the things I found out is if you look at letters that came from these people who simply retreated straight through Gettysburg to Cemetery Hill, most of them are saying, well, you know, it was a leisurely stroll. We got out of the way. The Confederates didn't push too much. But if you read other letters, it's talking about a traffic jam, you know, wagons backed up and all sorts. Well, those letters are coming from over where the two corps intersect. Uh, the first corps coming in one way, Von Amsburg the other, they're meeting in the middle. The Confederates following them, of course, block off the roads and start shooting. So if you're a member of that group, you've got two choices. You can hunker down where you are, or you can make a run for it and risk getting shot. So somewhere between 200 and 400, nobody's really sure, men hold up in the Eagle Hotel and the buildings around the Eagle Hotel. And this is kind of interesting because why don't the Confederates attack Cemetery Hill on July 1? I'm not aware of anybody that's ever looked into this. You've got, well, to average the two difference, you've got 300 armed men in the middle of Gettysburg holding out, shooting at people. You know, the Confederates don't have a free hand to just go through Gettysburg, align themselves, and decide they're going to attack. Cemetery Hill. They hold out until dusk when they run out of ammunition. They turn down two or three Confederate attempts to get them to surrender. Finally, Ewell sends in a flag of truce and tells Captain Ursh, look, come on out, ride around town with us. You can see there's no Federals left. Nobody's going to rescue you. So he does. And he's convinced there's no other Federals in town. He goes back. They're out of ammunition. He tells his men, 
break your weapons, we're going to surrender. So they all break their weapons and they surrender. So it's not until dusk, almost dusk, that the Confederates really have a free hand to form any kind of attack in Gettysburg. So we look something like this. Edwin Coddington has been called the Bible of Gettysburg. He claims the 11th Corps had a numerical advantage. If any of you are good at remembering numbers, you can remember 10 minutes ago. If you look, if you add up all of the 11th Corps units that actually participated on July 1, and all of the Confederate units that they actually faced on July 1, the Confederates had a 2,000, well, 1,500 man advantage, and they also had an advantage in artillery pieces. He claims the 11th Corps caused only 14% loss. So obviously they didn't fight for very long. Well, Gordon's brigade is kind of interesting because it led the Confederate assault. But after July 1, aside from a little bit of skirmishing, they really weren't involved in any more attacks. Gordon's brigade itself lost 33.7%, a third of its men. So where he gets this 14% from, I'm not sure. He claims the 11th Corps did not fight well because it had a large number of missing. Can anybody, raise your hands, can anybody tell me what missing means? <laughs> the last time I looked, it meant missing. And nobody knew, they could be dead, they could be wounded, in the hospital, on the field, maybe they were prisoners. You know, they take roll call that night, and you know, Joe's not here. What happened to him? I don't know. I didn't see him, so he's listed as missing. You know, missing doesn't mean you ran away, which apparently Coddington thinks. But there's another interesting point here. The 11th Corps was 16.4 percent missing. How many people think the first corps were cowards? but they lost 17.7% missing. So you see how fallacious some of these attempts at using statistics to prove something really are. First Corps lost six colors, the 11th Corps lost three. And the Wisconsin one, I'm not sure. In 64, they wrote back home and asked for a new stand of state and national colors. They said the national colors, there's really nothing left of them but ribbons. And the state color, he said, was lost at Gettysburg. I've done a lot of research and I've written to other people. Nobody can ever find any reference to it ever being captured at Gettysburg. So when he says lost, he might just mean that, you know, it was torn up or it was so badly used that they discarded it or something. Who knows? But I put it in there anyway, just so that my first core friends won't get mad at me. <laughs> So July 2, the Confederates are going to do their major effort uh, on the left of the Union line. And Johnson's Confederate division is supposed to attack in concert with that to keep the Federals from moving troops around. Instead of attacking in concert with that, they don't attack until later in the evening. So during the course of the day, gradually 12 Corps troops are siphoned off to meet the Confederate attacks at the Little Round Top and the southern portion of Cemetery Ridge. So by evening, there's only one brigade of the 12th Corps left holding all of Culp's Hill. Fortunately, it was George Green's New Yorkers. Green was the oldest general on the field. And this is a good case of the elderly people being the wisest. <laughs> because the previous day when his men arrived there exhausted, he said, no, you're not going to camp. You're going to build entrenchments. So they spent the night building entrenchments. So not only did they have a high hill and woods and rocks to, got, to uh, use as fortifications, but they actually built breastworks up there. So Johnson finally gets his attack underway in the early evening. Green calls for reinforcements. And the 11th Corps sends over its reserve brigade. Two regiments go to the right to protect Green's right from being outflanked by the Confederates. 
And the other two, including the 82nd Illinois, uh, go into the trenches to relieve some of Green's troops who were completely out of ammunition by this time. Following the battle, they were praised in the reports, the 11th Corps troops were praised in the reports of Slocum, Green, and Wadsworth, Wadsworth being from the first uh, corps. Uh, and Green's report, he said, these regiments rendered good service, being sent into the trenches to relieve our regiments as their ammunition was exhausted and their muskets required cleaning. And I like cute little episodes that happen. Uh, the colonel, the lieutenant colonel leading the 82nd Illinois, uh, someone came up to him after the battle from presumably the 12th Corps and shook his hand vigorously and said, oh, if you had only been here yesterday instead of that damned 11th Corps, we would not have been driven back. To which Colonel Salmon later reported, he responded, you are a miserable hound, sir. <laughs> I suspect he probably real, really said something else, <laughs> but this is at least what he wrote about the episode. As the Culps Hill battle is receding now, two brigades are launched on Cemetery Hill, which is held by the 11th Corps. This is, of course, a modern picture. Uh, the 11th Corps battery atop Cemetery Hill was Wiedrich's battery, a German battery from Buffalo, New York. They had three-inch rifled guns, as you can see here. And this is approximately where the original position was. If you look at pictures taken right after the battle, this modern lunette here is just about where the original one was. Now, picture yourself coming from, say, the top of the screen as a Confederate attacking. You get down to the bottom of the hill and start up. How are those guns ever going to shoot at you? Now, if you look at the barrel and you put it down, you're going to be shooting into the ground because there's they're recessed back. They were never they were never in place to defend a hill. They were in place the day before to shoot over the town to support the federal troops north of Gettysburg. And we know they reached that far because Buford sent back a messenger saying. Adjust your fire, you're hitting your own men. <laughs> so the artillery battery really was almost useless firing against infantry attacking the hill. They could at long range, but once they got in under the shadow of the hill, couldn't fire at them. And here's one of my favorite pictures. Here's the stone fence they were behind. If you take a magnifying glass and look, the fence is two to three stones high. And this is not Fredericksburg. This is not the big stone wall of Fredericksburg. This is a little loose wall where farmers gathered up rocks and piled them where the marker between their field was. Uh, these are loose, you could go and you could kick them over. Uh, most of them are no more than two feet high. At the most, they're about three feet high. And in the background, you can see this horse. And even though he's in the background, he's still taller than the rocks in the foreground. So this is not a big barrier, like, oh my God, they had a stone wall to hide behind. This is not Fredericksburg. And what's that? I'll give you a hint. It's a hill. Okay. The Confederate attack is going to come from on the upper right hand side of the screen. So they form in the bed of a creek, and then they have to come up this hill and top the hill to charge down on the 11th Corps. But look how the crest of that hill, and those little things sticking up are corn stalks. You crest that hill, and look at the short distance between there and the 11th Corps position. Infantry attacking over that hill, you're going to get one shot at them, and by the time you reload, they're on top of you. Anybody ever remember seeing this in Gettysburg in any of your trips? Because, of course, today it doesn't exist. When they built that elementary or middle school or whatever it is, they leveled the hill. So if you're looking at a black and white map, you know, it looks flat, but it's not. So this is, this is not an impregnable position. This defensive position had a lot of weaknesses. 
1,150 Union defenders, 2,100 attacking Confederates. Uh, Ames had 600 yards of front to cover. If he stretched his men out, it was one person every two yards. And there was no reserve because the reserve, of course, had been sent over to Culp's Hill. Uh, there were only two regiments in reserve. Uh, Colonel Chizanovsky had two regiments in Evergreen Cemetery, numbering no more than 400 men total between them. So if we look at Cemetery Hill, von Steinwehr is there, Weidrich battery atop the hill, and then you've got Ricketts and Breck from the artillery reserve as well. You have Harris's brigade here, von Gilsa's brigade here, they were so short of troops that they borrowed the 33rd Massachusetts from von Steinwehr's division and stuck it over at the end so that they had enough troops to almost reach Culp's Hill where Whittier's battery was in place. And here's the two regiments in reserve. So you have Hayes Brigade ready to attack and you have Avery. Does anyone Notice another weakness in the federal line. <clears throat> Who notices a big hole right in the middle? <laughs> and here's where, again, it's difficult to get the correct story. Apparently, somebody, either Schertz uh, or perhaps one of the other officers, sent an order to Harris, the brigade commander, to have somebody fill up that hole. Harris turned to Major Brady, leading the 17th Connecticut, and said, you know, you need to fill up that hole. Apparently, the 17th Connecticut was fairly large. Apparently, the intent was for him to move some of his troops over to plug that hole. But of course, what he does is move the entire regiment over there, <laughs> which only moves the hole down a little bit farther. And as the luck of the 11th Corps would have it, that's exactly where the Confederates attacked. Yes, ma'am. How, how big would that hole be? Uh, uh, probably, I don't know, 40, 50 yards, maybe? Because the whole position was 600 yards. Yeah, yeah. I would say probably at least 50 yards, yeah. Uh, so they break through. We know that the two Ohio regiments rallied at the top of the hill because the 107th Ohio captured the colors of the 8th Louisiana. The other two are stopped dead at the stone wall. You have Whittier's battery opening up. Now, if you're in the North Carolinians and artillery is firing from the left and you're ordered to attack straight ahead, human, human nature is you're going to start wandering off to the right to get away from the artillery. And that's kind of what happens. They start out in one direction and end up in another. The 153rd Pennsylvania stops them dead in their tracks, but they break through the two smallest regiments in the entire line, uh, and they end up in uh, Ricketts Battery, where the 11th Corps regiments rally, and they fight them there. And then later, the 2nd Corps sends over some reinforcements. And of course, the 11th Corps reserve attacks, and they drive the Confederates out of Weidrich's Battery and back down the hill. Now, there's an interesting story here. One of the gunners in Weidrich's battery uh, was apparently knocked, knocked over and wounded uh, and lost um, his sword. A Confederate, he says, grabbed him and started hauling him down the hill. Um, and at some point, the Confederate gave up and, and retreated and took his sword. And apparently about a year and a half later, after the 11th Corps was shipped out west, a package arrived and it was his sword. Apparently, federal troops had recaptured it, and his name and regiment were on it, so they forwarded it to him in Chattanooga. <laughs> the senior surviving North Carolina officer uh, said the enemy stood with a tenacity never before displayed by them. 57th North Carolina, we were under a desperate fire. Only a few got to the batteries and could not hold them. There was harder fighting today than ever I knew of. Uh, Charles Wainwright, who was the artillery commander for the First Corps and did not particularly like the 11th Corps, especially the Germans, after the battle, 
wrote that they fought splendidly, sticking to their guns and finally driving the Rebs out. The Germans have got fight in them. How have historians looked at this? Two of my favorites. I won't tell you who I'm ascribing them to. I don't want to be shot the next time I'm at Gettysburg. Two brigades of the 11th Corps were decisively beaten by two brigades under Harry Hayes and Isaac Abrams. This, despite the fact that the Federals had more than 24 hours to rest and fortify their position, were fighting on the defensive with artillery support and had the advantage of terrain. 24 hours to rest? I mean, there was an artillery barrage for over two hours that afternoon. Sharpshooting began as soon as uh, the daybreak. They're hiding behind this little two-foot thing of rocks to avoid sharpshooters, but apparently they had 24 hours to rest and improve their position. And my real favorite, the Confederates fought their way up and over stone walls and abated us through nets and other earthworks and defeated them, capturing numerous artillery pieces in the process. There were no earthworks, there were no abatis. And what exactly did they capture? In round numbers, nothing. Think about it. I went to the Confederate battle reports and to some of the letters written by Confederate officers to try to find out how many people are we actually talking about here? because uh, sometimes the official records are never really that accurate. And according to things that Confederates themselves were writing, Avery's Brigade lost 412 men, Hayes 332, a total of 35.4% of the attacking force. Over a third of the attacking force became casualties. And what did they go away with? They did not take away any guns. And at the end of the battle, they did not occupy a single foot of territory that they had not occupied before the battle began. So they really achieved nothing. If you add up the numbers that the Confederates give, some people will say, well, not many people went off. But both the North Carolina and Louisiana brigades, there were people who wrote and said, well, only about 75 of us reached the guns. Or in another a letter from North Carolina was only about 50 of us ever reached the guns. If you take the highest number that they cite, only about 4.8% of the attacking force actually made it up the hill. So this was not a major breakthrough. This was an attack and a repulse. July 3rd, the 11th Corps batteries on Cemetery Hill were able to zero in on the left flank of Pickett's Charge. Wheeler's 13th New York was dispatched to the Cops of Trees midway uh, through the Confederate bombardment to support, or to, I should say, replace a Union battery that had run out of ammunition. Now, everybody's familiar with the Vermont Brigade, which came out and enfiladed them. And occasionally you hear that on the other end of the line, the 8th Ohio also was able to outflank them. How many people know that two 11th Corps regiments also went out and outflanked them? And they captured five stand of colors. So clearly they did something, but you never hear about it. You hear about General Schimmelfennig, right? Yeah. Uh, it's, you read about poor General Schimmelfennig, you ah, how this stupid old German guy hanging out in a, in a hog shed. Well, isn't it the duty of an officer to try to evade escape? And how many times do you ever hear of General, what was his name, Rowley, I think, in the first corps, who was later cashiered for drunkenness at Gettysburg? Until recently, almost nobody mentions that. And here Schimmelfennig hides for two days and then rejoins his unit after the battle, and somehow people make fun of him. So what are the results? Let's look at casualties. The first corps suffered the highest number of casualties or percent in the battle, the 11th corps the second. So somebody's doing some fighting. If you look at division losses, the two highest were in the first corps, the two second highest were in the 11th corps. If you look at regimental losses, three of the top six were in the 11th corps. 
July 1st, they marched over 13 miles in four and a half hours through a rainstorm, through sun, through humidity, in order to prevent the First Corps from being outflanked, as I showed you earlier. They helped to defeat O'Neill's attack on the flank of the First Corps. They crippled Page's battery so badly it had to be withdrawn from the battle. They fought well on Blocker's Knoll, although seriously outnumbered. They rallied at the almshouse until driven back. They rallied again in town until driven back. And then they rallied on Cemetery Hill. July 2, I didn't talk about this, but Weedrick's battery pummeled Latimer's Confederate battery on Benner Hill so badly it had to be withdrawn. The Corps held firm under a hour and a half, two and a half hour, uh, you know, estimates vary, Confederate artillery barrage. They sent a brigade to help uh, the 12th Corps that performed very well. They held Cemetery Hill against the Confederate assault. July 3rd, they held firm under this three-hour Confederate bombardment. Uh, Major Osborne, the uh, artillery chief of the 11th Corps, was in charge of sighting the guns on the right flank of the Union line against Pickett's charge. Uh, Wheeler's battery uh, was sent to reinforce Cemetery Ridge. And the 136th New York and 73rd Pennsylvania outflanked the Confederate left. So I think they behaved pretty well, all things considered. Three medals of honor. Uh, Franz Ursch, who held the uh, hotel, the Eagle Hotel, was later awarded a Medal of Honor. Uh, Charles Stacy, uh, during the sharpshooting of July 2, crawled out into the middle of a field between the lines and hid behind a wooden fence post so he could spot Confederate sharpshooters and point them out to his own sharpshooters back there. Uh, he was awarded a Medal of Honor. And Richard Enderlin, 73rd Ohio. Enderlin was assigned to the medical detachment, so he really didn't even have to fight, but he volunteered to take a rifle and go into the ranks during the battle. Uh, he heard one of his uh, uh, regimental colleagues out in the middle between the lines wounded, uh, crying for help and water and so forth. So he, fi <clears throat> he finally ended up crawling out into the middle of the field under fire and dragging him back to Union lines and was awarded a Medal of Honor for saving the life of the great grandfather of Richard Nixon. So I thank you for your patience. And if you have any questions, assuming we have some time left, I'll be happy to try and respond. Yes, I think, yeah. I think Howard is largely responsible for the debacle at Chancellorsville. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I forgot my commercial. <laughs> I do have copies of my two books on the 11th floor. I think they sell for $34.95. You wonderful people can have them for 20 bucks a piece if you stick around. So I think he was, he was horrible at Chancellorsville. But at Gettysburg, <laughs> He shows up, finds out he's in command of the field. The only orders he received the night before from Meade were that the army was going to form along Plum Run. So now what does he do? Do I retreat? Well, after Chancellorsville, he wasn't really inclined to retreat and you know, get more complaints about him. Uh, so he decides to hang out there. All right, fine. What does he do? He goes through town, goes up in an observatory with binoculars to try and see what's happening on the front line. He trots out to the 11th Corps. Somehow he misses shirts, but he talks, I think, with a couple of the officers in the 11th Corps. Then he trots over to talk with Doubleday and Wadsworth in the 1st Corps. Then he goes back to Cemetery Hill. I mean, that's his command post, right? And Cemetery Hill is high enough at that point. There are a few obstructions. You could see what was going on. 
He sends a message to Slocum, six, seven miles away. You know, what tells him what's going on, please come to our aid. And during the rest of the afternoon, he sends three or four other messengers. You know, are you on your way? You know, we need you right away, blah, blah, blah. Then he sends a messenger to Dan Sickles at Emmitsburg, telling him what's happened, asking him to come forward. Sickles immediately replies and says, I'm on my way. He sends a message to me to tell him what's going on and to tell him that Reynolds is dead. And Hancock says he arrived there at 4.30. Almost everybody else says it was more like 5.30. By the time Hancock gets to Cemetery Hill, the troops are pretty much rallied all day. The First Corps is in position along Cemetery Ridge. The 11th is holding Cemetery Hill. Uh, he meets, Hancock meets Howard. And the only disposition Hancock makes that's different from what Howard did is he decides to send one of the uh, brigades from the First Corps over to occupy Culp's Hill. And according to witnesses, Howard responded something like, you know, that's right, that needs to be done, or that's right, that's the right move, or something. So by the time Hancock shows up, the fighting is pretty much over for the day. The federal troops are in positions they were going to hold during the battle, except for moving the one break brigade to <coughs> occupy Pulp Hill, which was a good move. So I, I find it hard to really find fault with Howard. I and mean, what else was he supposed to do? And by the time the troops are retreating, he has one brigade in reserve. Four regiments, actually three, because I think one of them had been detailed to guard the wagon train or something and hadn't come up yet. So he really has no fresh troops on hand to do anything with them, even if he wanted to. So I, I find it hard to fault him on July 1 at Gettysburg. That's probably more than you ever wanted, but there you go. Was he responsible then for identifying Cemetery Hill as the original Cemetery Hill and I think so, yeah. I think so. One of Reynolds' staff officers later claimed that Reynolds said that, that he was going to have that as the rallying point, which he may have. But Reynolds was dead by that time. By the time Howard got there, Reynolds was a West Point officer. He would have been aware of terrain. So he may very well have recognized that that was an important position. But there were no federal troops on there until Howard came along. And Howard, of course, didn't know what Reynolds was thinking. He was dead. So Howard was the person who uh, put a couple of batteries of artillery and, and a brigade of infantry on there to hold the hill. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. What was who doing? He was leading the 11th Corps. So he must have been ordered then to go again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm getting the impression that no. it's just like you want to kick yourself from now and well, No, you're right. Way off, way off. Yeah. We the, know that when Reynolds died, he yeah. had these last orders in his pocket. Yeah. And Howard may not have known it. Exactly. He didn't know that much, which was to say that. Exactly. So the maps, which really helped. In my opinion, yeah. and I think in the opinion of us. Yeah. So that, yes, Pike Creek was a circular, it was circular, yeah. but he was ordered to go up. Yeah. Okay. Howard, Howard met with Reynolds the night before the battle because the two corps were camped just a few miles apart. Uh, in fact, he met with him twice uh, because after meeting with him the first time, he got a, a courier said, you know, to come. Reynolds had some some new material or information. Reynolds, of course, was I don't know what you would call a wing commander. Uh, Meade placed Reynolds in charge of the first and the eleventh uh, corps, and what was the other one? Third, yeah, and third. So Reynolds was in charge of all those, and it's Reynolds on July 1st that moves the first court to Gettysburg and orders Howard to follow him within supporting distance. And then Reynolds later sends an aide who catches up with Howard and Howard says, well, where do you want me? And apparently they were around the peach orchard at that time. Uh, and the, the aide that um, Reynolds had sent, of course, didn't know Reynolds was dead by that time. 
and said, well, I'm not sure, but right around here should be fine as long as you're in supporting distance. Uh, so then, you know, the next aide comes and says, you know, Reynolds is dead. You're in charge. <laughs> yeah. And then just to follow up, I mean, yep. you want to wait upon choosing the defensive position there. I, yep. I believe Howard received the thanks of Congress for that. Yeah. For choosing yeah. Cemetery Hill. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know. I mean, he, Reynolds may have noticed where he's taking it. Yeah. He did receive the well, Reynolds did decide to commit to the battle. Yeah, absolutely. Well, but I mean, the Congress, yeah. the Congress, the Congress, the Congress, the Congress. Yeah. 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 The, I, I probably ought to say as much bad press as Dan Sickles gets when he received Howard's message that they were engaged and needed support. He had just been rebuked the day before by me uh, for moving too slowly. Uh, and me, told him to stay at Emmitsburg and guard the flank. So Sickles is now in a position, you know, do I disobey the commanding officer or what do I do? And I think much to his credit, he left one brigade at Emmitsburg to watch the flank and led the other two immediately to the battlefield where the battle was actually going on. So I, I have to at least give him credit for that. Which Slocum didn't. Which Slocum did not. I made the mistake I was speaking to a group in Syracuse, New York, completely forgetting that Slocum was from the Syracuse area. <laughs> uh, and I mentioned how, you know, his name was so appropriate because he was very slow to get to Gettysburg. And afterwards, someone came up and said, well, you know, that was my great uncle or something. Thank <laughs> <laughs> goodness. Yeah. 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 But he was nice about it. He was nice. I asked Ed Barth. Oh, really? Yeah. And he gave me the answer that I agree with. So what's your opinion? Well, Slocum later said, and one or two other people later said from the 12th Corps that they could not hear the engagement going on and that he had been ordered to the position he was in by me and didn't think that Howard had the authority to override that, and which may have been true. But then there are at least two or three other letters written by or reports after the war written by people in the 12th floor who said yeah we could clearly hear you know cannon fire in the distance so it may have been one of those occasions where you know, depends on what side of town you're on the sound reaches one place but it doesn't reach somewhere else i don't know but i think he he had at least three messengers at least three from howard urging him to come quickly they needed support right away I think any reasonable officer would have at least sent a division or two over to find out what was going on when your compatriots are calling for help. But if he had arrived, he would have been in the main Yeah, he, uh, he would have arrived to the east of Culp's Hill, might very well have outflanked the Confederate Army on that side, and you know, you wouldn't have had July too. Or at least it wouldn't have developed the way it did. You know? yeah. Yeah. Well, you also hear Smith's Virginia Brigade and another one, I don't recall which one it was, another of Ewell's brigades were sent out north of Culp's Hill to guard the roads because somebody said they saw federal soldiers out there. And the story the Confederates give is, well, they got there and it was really a bunch of you know, fences. Well, maybe and maybe not. It's hard to tell because everybody, there was no standardized time. Everybody's watch was on a different time. It's hard to tell, but by dusk when that was happening is when some of the 12th Corps was starting to finally move. It could very well have been 12th Corps soldiers who were on the road south to Gettysburg. And, you know, had they turned west at that point, they would have caught the Confederates in the flank. But they didn't. Other questions? Have I tired you all out? <laughs> well, thank you for your attention and for coming tonight. I appreciate it.